classified plans in case of a 9-11 style attack. This fee charged on every plane ticket is supposed to improve airports. We learn that millions go directly to airlines. Doesn't sound right, really? Plus, automation kills jobs once thought untouchable. Really, nobody's immune from this. Leaking classified documents in Canada is an offense under the Security of Information Act. But what about when the documents are given directly to a journalist under access to information by the government itself? That's what happened when a CBC News producer made a request for briefing notes about NORAD's response to a 9-11 style attack. The documents arrived marked classified and classified secret. They were also marked in places for redaction. But as Murray Brewster tells us, all of the highly sensitive information was entirely visible. This is what defense planners are hoping to avoid. It is their nightmare scenario. Another 9-11, but this one committed on Canadian soil. What would Canadian leaders do faced with the prospect of a civilian airliner turned into a flying bomb? Enter Operation Noble Eagle, a joint U.S.-Canada partnership meant to prevent another 9-11. And the briefing, delivered in 2015 to the new Chief of Defence Staff. The plan lays down under what circumstances a hijacked airliner would be shot down. It includes who would make the decision to pull the trigger and when, how many minutes they have. It talks about how to minimize falling debris and civilian casualties on the ground. It runs a scenario about a jet crashing into the CN Tower and how many fighter jets both the U.S. and Canada have on standby. It's all highly secret. Yet, it was released to an enterprising producer at CBC News under access to information without proper censoring. It was a mistake, uh, or potentially a mistake. Uh, we'll follow up, of course. CBC News has chosen not to reveal the specific details of the plan for national security reasons. There is no public interest in broadcasting the mechanics. The public interest lies in the mishandling of the information. This all comes at a time when the country's second highest military commander is under RCMP investigation. Vice Admiral Mark Norman is apparently accused of revealing classified information. And it comes one day after CBC News reported there have been at least 11 internal investigations at D&D into mishandling of secrets. Vance was forced to issue a new directive last summer, underscoring the need to be careful. Uh, we issued that directive uh, because uh, we were concerned. Uh, generally speaking, we are uh, very good uh, at managing the classified information. Vance says he does not believe this latest mistake will affect relations with the U.S. military, but it comes at an awkward time. The President of the United States. The Trudeau government is trying to figure out how to manage relations with the Trump administration and a Washington establishment that is still reeling from election hacking and leaking. It certainly won't help. I mean, I put this in the category of things that are regrettable, dumb, but probably not catastrophic. But, you know, this is not good, and it does undermine confidence in the uh, sharing of very confidential information among allies. The defence minister needs to, in very short order, get a handle on this to make sure that there is no other leaks. We have very strong systems in place. When those systems uh, break down or are not followed, there are uh, inevitably uh, follow-ups and, and consequences. And it is those consequences the Liberals will have to struggle with. This is, after all, the government that started out by promising Canadians more openness and accountability. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, let's turn now to another CBC News exclusive. It's about airport improvement fees. For years, they've been slapped onto ticket prices, and they're non-negotiable. They're supposed to go toward things like maintaining buildings and fixing the tarmac. But it turns out some of that money is actually going straight back to the big airlines to the tune of millions of dollars. Angela McIver has been digging into this story for us. Airport improvement fees. They're advertised as a way for airports to pay for upgrades. And while you may think all of the money goes to runways and fancy kiosks, airlines are also taking a cut. 
So how much are airlines making? Take Air Canada, for example. It has on average 36 million passengers every year. When you add it up, it means that Air Canada is making more than $36 million from this fee alone. That's not even including all of the other airlines also collecting this fee. Passenger rights advocate Gabor Lukacs says it's a practice that needs to stop. That's a no-brainer. Um, that kind of sharing of revenue is something that I find illegal, possibly, and unethical for sure. If I'm paying some taxes to improve the airport, that money at the very least has to go to the airports. For example, in Halifax, airlines get 6% of the $25 fee, which at $1.50 a ticket doesn't sound like much, but it adds up. Here's how it stacks up across the country. The National Airlines Council of Canada claims it's a processing fee for handling the payment. Typically, processing fees are no higher than 1 or 2 percent. Peter Spurway says from the Halifax airport's viewpoint, compensating airlines makes sense. They're dealing with millions of passengers and in some cases the, uh, the credit card element does come into it, so there are those fees that they have to manage as well. But passengers aren't as lenient. It doesn't sound right, really? So I'm already paying for a ticket to an airline now, including an extra fee inside the tax. Don't think that sounds fair. Does that surprise you at all? Sadly, no, it does not. Not at all. So, I mean, it's just like any other taxes. You just assume that there's only a small percentage that actually goes where it's supposed to. For Lukacs, another alarm bell is the fact airlines and airports haven't been transparent. We are talking about agreements that govern how much we pay, how we pay, and where the money goes. The public has the right to know that. And this kind of secrecy is a concern. Airline employees traveling on business and children under two are not required to pay the fee, but people who book their ticket with reward points will be charged. Angela McIver, CBC News, Halifax. CBC News first broke the troubling story about sexual harassment within the RCMP. Complaint after complaint followed. They prompted the RCMP commissioner to issue an emotional public apology. Tonight, a new angle on the story that comes to us once again from the CBC's Natalie Clancy. We hurt you. For that, I'm truly sorry. When the RCMP commissioner acknowledged decades of shameful conduct in October, it appears that did not include every woman with a claim against the force, including two of Dr. Greg Passy's patients. The crocodile tears uh, by the commissioner that was not about empathy or sympathy. That was about humiliation and embarrassment and having to apologize for this harassment and abuse of power that occurred on his watch. He says that because the RCMP continues to deny his patients' allegations. In Corporal Susan Gastaldo's lawsuit, she claims her supervisor repeatedly sexually assaulted her on the job. She was disciplined for what the force calls a consensual affair, but was later cleared of wrongdoing. You're in the middle of a business conversation and they wanted to ask you when, when you're going to have sex with them. The other patient, Atoya Montague, claims she was sexually harassed by a senior officer who has since been charged with sexually assaulting another co-worker. She is furious her bosses visited her psychiatrist less than a month after Paulson's apology. The idea that, again, a senior management person from this organization would come into my office, a physician, a specialist in regards to PTSD, and attempt to bully me into changing my opinion um, and with a threat that they're going to go to the college, um, that totally blew me away. He took it as a threat because the RCMP had done it before, filing a professional complaint against psychologist Mike Webster, who was critical of the force. But the RCMP says there was no threat to complain about Dr. Passy's medical license. All he's saying is, how can I send someone back into a workplace where there's been, where she's been abused, when you haven't even so much as acknowledged that that has happened? None of the allegations have been proven in court. In a statement, the RCMP denies managers tried to bully her psychiatrist. The force says they can't indefinitely pay full salary to employees who they believe are unfit for duty for the foreseeable future. But Dr. Passy says the RCMP should just settle their lawsuits so they will recover faster and go back to work, not get fired. Uh -oh. Will you intervene in their firings? The public safety minister has already ordered an investigation of their cases and that of two other women who complained to him. When you have this pattern, over time, it obviously speaks to some pretty deep-seated 
problems. Uh, and, and that is why I have taken a multi-pronged approach to dealing with it. Goodell says he is waiting for former Auditor General Sheila Fraser's report at the end of the month to advise him on how the RCMP is doing when it comes to sexual harassment. Natalie Clancy, CBC News, Vancouver. In the eastern United States tonight, millions of people are in the path of a severe weather system. The same storm produced tornadoes across the Midwest last night, killing three people. Ran downstairs, I was watching out the basement window and it just went right over the top of us. Aerial images capture the scale of destruction in the small Illinois town of Ottawa. More than 100 homes were destroyed there. The National Weather Service received reports of nearly two dozen tornadoes across five states. The CEO of ride-sharing service Uber is apologizing again tonight after video leaked off him having a heated argument with a driver over the company's business practresses. Don't like to take responsibility for that. They, they, they blame everything but in their life on somebody else. why you an email for town card? Good luck. Travis Kalanick says he's ashamed of the exchange and that he needs to grow up. The driver reportedly gave him a one-star rating. Murder charges have formally been laid in the death of Kim Jong-nam. Two women, one from Indonesia, the other from Vietnam, are accused of using a nerve agent to kill the estranged half-brother of North Korea's leader. If convicted, they could face the death penalty. Coming up, how automation is killing white-collar jobs. Medicine, law, investment banking. And during our second break, we'll again be taking viewer questions on our live Facebook broadcast. It's an online-only feature. Donald Trump surprised many in November, and he did it again last night. The reviews of his first big speech to Congress rolled in today. The general consensus, it was pretty good. He sounded presidential. Trump spoke at length about unity, positivity, and recovery. But... As Paul Hunter tells us, talking and doing are two different things. Well, will you look at that? March 1st and Washington's famed cherry blossoms are out already. A sure signal spring is around the corner and better times are just ahead. Or are they? The day after last night's big speech by Donald Trump, headlines highlight his new, softer tone. Yet the country seems, as ever, divided. I thought he sounded more presidential than he'd ever had before. More hopeful than he's been before, but I don't see a lot of specifics. In my personal opinion, I do not feel that he really did reach out enough to people on the other side of the aisle. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. Without a doubt, last night's address to Congress showcased a different kind of Donald Trump, an optimistic, more positive Donald Trump. Everything that is broken in our country can be fixed. Every problem can be solved. A far cry from the drug-addled, poverty-stricken America he described in his inaugural address, likening abandoned factories to tombstones. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. We're just here to start the process. And as he sat down with leaders of his own party today to talk about the weeks and months to come, the Republican view last night was the real deal. It was a great speech and a great night for America. Uh, what, you, what the American people saw last night is the president that I serve with every day. And yet, in this now hyper-partisan country, those are Republicans who mostly cheered last night, and those are Democrats who mostly didn't, deep divisions remain. Say Democrats today, what matters are Trump's actions, not words. There's a low bar here among a lot of the media. Oh, well, he wasn't nasty. That is not enough to get America uh, uh, in the place where we have to go. So the question, was last night a temporary new tone or a whole new Trump? The answer may come later this week when he's expected to announce a revised version of that travel ban. Will he ease up or stay the course on a directive that has enraged countless? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. In Alberta, 15 people accused of a range of crimes are walking free. Their charges stayed. 
The reason given by Edmonton's chief crown prosecutor was a lack of resources. The cases are victims of a backlog. And as Briar Stewart explains, the gears of justice are grinding, not just in Alberta, but across the country. When Christopher Liberty put a boot on a vehicle that was parked illegally last February, he says a man came out and threatened to attack him with a box cutter. He then went after Liberty's vehicle with a metal bar. If I wasn't fast on my feet to get into my car, God knows what would have happened. Liberty works with his mother at a parking enforcement company. They were told that a man had been charged and would be going to trial later this month. But yesterday the charges were suddenly stayed, meaning the court case has been shelved. And the Liberties only found out when CBC called them. Most we can do is just hope that one day we do get our day in court. It's pretty disappointing to knowing that, especially what happened, that this gentleman is walking clear. His case was one of 15 stayed yesterday by Edmonton's chief crown prosecutor. The reason? There was not enough staff to take the case to trial. That's indicative of the, the years of neglect that we've suffered. Alberta's Association of Crown Attorneys says the problem runs much deeper. Significant criminal offences are being abandoned and not prosecuted for no other reason than resources. Since January, it says at least 200 criminal cases in Alberta have been stayed under a new triage system. With courts backlogged, the priority is to get the most serious cases, like murder, to trial, while choosing what other cases to discard. We do support taking a more rationalized approach to it, uh, rather than just having the court choose which matters um, wind up getting stayed. By that, she means stayed because of lengthy delays. A ruling last year by the Supreme Court of Canada set limits on how long it should take for cases to go to trial. And provinces are now grappling with the consequences. I think courts across the country are feeling the pressure. They are f trying to find ways of doing things more quickly, of uh, clearing their backlogs. For example, Manitoba is proposing to eliminate preliminary inquiries. In Alberta, the Crown prosecutors are calling for a hiring freeze to be lifted and another 50 prosecutors to be added. The government says any new financial commitments will come out later this month in the provincial budget. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Edmonton. The only school in a small Nunavut community burned to the ground overnight. Temperatures were in the minus 50s with the wind at the time. The fire chief said two trucks were shuttling water to the site, but the hoses kept freezing. The school was also used as an emergency shelter in the event of power outages and provided both breakfast and lunch programs. Subway says its chicken is exactly that, chicken. Last week, a CBC Marketplace investigation found the chicken also contained significant levels of soy DNA. Subway says that is absolutely false and misleading. A list of ingredients Subway supplied for the chicken patty before the lab tests were done did contain some soy. Marketplace says it stands by its story and has released the Subway test results online. If you're one of Sugar Mobile's 5,500 customers, you're out of luck. The CRTC has ordered the upstart to shut down. Sugar was launched last year by ICE Wireless. It gave customers cheaper access to the big telecom companies' networks through reciprocal roaming agreements. But the CRTC said ICE was basically allowing its customers to consistently roam on those larger networks and ruled it must stop. A suspicious fire at a Toronto Islamic Centre and a bomb threat targeting Muslim students at Concordia University in Montreal. Alone, each would be cause for concern. But together, in a single day, they add to fears that Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are on the rise. Ron Charles has the story. Concordia University evacuated two of its largest buildings this morning because of a detailed bomb threat with a very specific target. The threat was specific, uh, and unfortunately, it was against our Muslim students. Police found no explosives. Whoever sent the emailed threat claimed to be with a group calling itself the Council of Conservative Citizens of Canada. Their document said things have changed since Donald Trump's election. It complained of Muslim prayers at the school and attendees 
walking between their prayer space and the men's room in flip-flops with bare, wet feet while we try to study or eat lunch. We think it's just like trying to take us apart, but uh, we're all Canadians. Uh, doesn't matter what like uh, color, uh, nationality, or uh, even uh, religion we are. We're just one at the same. The Montreal threat came within hours of firefighters extinguishing flames on the roof of a Toronto mosque. Police are investigating it as arson after finding a gas can nearby. The mosque's imam reached out. If somebody has intentionally, of course, we are, the hearts are saddened and we're disappointed. And we wish good for that person in that he can, we can clarify to him maybe the misconception which led him to commit this act which he tried to commit. Advocates are reporting a spike in acts of religious and racial hatred across North America. Jewish community centers in more than two dozen U.S. cities and in Calgary have received bomb threats. It's absolutely outrageous um, that this is occurring. Uh, it's unprecedented in terms of the scale of that. The threats seem to have increased in the months following the U.S. presidential election. Bernie Farver says in his three decades fighting against hate groups, he's never seen them so inspired. When it takes the president of the strongest democracy, the most free democracy allegedly on earth, to, if it takes him six days to condemn hate, then that gives permission to the haters out there. They feel emboldened. Farber predicts police forces across Canada will have to bolster anti-hate crime units this year if official statistics confirm the surge of hate that activists perceive. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. As Montreal wrestles with the threat to Muslim students, today a Quebec City hospital bowed to pressure and put a crucifix back on its wall. It faced public outcry and alleged criminal threats when it removed the cross in the name of religious neutrality. As Ryan Hicks explains, it's a fresh wound in an old debate at a tense time. Built by the church, the saint Sacrament Hospital symbolizes the past it had in this province. And now it's a lightning rod in the debate over religious neutrality. Last week, a patient complained about a crucifix hanging on the wall. Hospital officials decided to take it down, citing the need to be religiously neutral. The move caused an outcry. Yes, it bothers me, says this woman. I asked them to put it back up, but they don't want to. Then came this from Cardinal Gérald Lacroix. If we allow the removal of this crucifix without reacting, what will be the next target? And reaction came pouring in. Hundreds called to complain. Thousands signed this petition promoted by local radio hosts. But one man crossed the line, threatening the hospital building and staff. Police arrested him yesterday, later freeing him on a promise to appear. You can share your opinions, your ideas about it. But what we want to remind people is you got to respect the law if you share those ideas. Then this morning, in the face of mounting public and political pressure, including from the premier, the hospital backtracked, a decision applauded by the health minister. Religious neutrality is now have about wiping out every sign about our heritage. We are in 2017. We're not in 1917's Russia, where after a revolution, they wiped out everything that was related even remotely to religion. This debate isn't new. In 2008, a commission on reasonable accommodation tackled the separation of church and state. Authors recommended taking down the crucifix from the National Assembly, but it remains to this day. Some believe that using public institutions as a stage for religious history is inherently anti-secular. These crucifix should be put in a special place to show respect to those symbols, religious symbols, and uh, we should not simply put them back on, up on the wall. Today's debate is likely to spill over into Quebec's National Assembly soon. The Liberal government is hoping to pass legislation that includes rules around religious accommodation. Ryan Hicks, CBC News, Quebec City. Straight ahead, automation now targets white collar jobs. You'll see how displaced workers are trying to adapt.
Hi there, Peter Mansbridge again. As you know, we're in a commercial break right now, so this isn't live, what I'm doing right now, but it is an opportunity to talk to you because we want to use these commercial breaks uh, for a different reason in the days ahead. We want to be able to talk to you and answer some of your questions. Uh, we've had a number already of been coming in ever since we were uh, putting the National on Facebook, and one of them, one of the constants has always been, what's my office look like? Now, I don't know why, why you really wanted to know that, but I'll, I'll give you an opportunity. This is it, it's kind of been transition now as I get ready to, uh, to move on to other things later this year. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the Na National uh, Host Office. It's great, it's an opportunity to uh, you know, keep some of the things you build up over the years. This is one of my favorites here, this picture was given to me after 25 years of the National. Why is it one of my favorites? Because you can look at it and actually watch me grow old. That's what I <laughs> said to them when I gave it to them. I said, gee, thanks, thanks a lot. It's really nice to see how quickly I grew old uh, in that picture. But anyway, it's a nice memento, the different backgrounds, the different looks of the National over the years, but the constant has always been what we're most proud of, and that's the integrity. Uh, of the broadcast itself and the journalists who work on it. All of them, both those you see on camera and uh, those who you don't uh, see who work behind the camera, whether it's the uh, camera operators, the director in the control room, all those people who put together the show every night, the writers, editors, uh, etc. So anyway, this is a little uh, glimpse of my office. It's a good size because we have meetings in here throughout the day and the major lineup uh, meeting of the uh, evening happens in this room as well where the senior editors get together. We discuss the order of the program that you're watching right now, what makes it onto the show, what doesn't make it onto the show. Anyway, we'll have the opportunity to take your questions live during the program and it'll start in the next break uh, coming up on the National. Uh, so I'll be in the studio all properly dressed with my tie on and everything at that point. But we hope you're enjoying this opportunity to do the National on Facebook and also the opportunity for you to get your questions in. So don't be shy, send them along and we'll try to answer as many as we can. It's time to get back to work. Talk to you soon. As the country turns 150, we're looking ahead to the next Canada. And boy, the times sure are changing. We always knew robots were a threat to manual laborers. For decades, automation has wiped out blue-collar jobs at an accelerating pace. Today, innovation is thinning out another kind of workforce. Here's Renee Filipponi with White Collar, Dark Future. This is Bruno. His job is to take a pizza off the end of this line and put it into the oven. Pretty cool, huh? Not only does Bruno make a great artisanal pizza pie, he never calls in sick. For argument's sake, it's a he. He never needs a vacation, no pension or benefits, and he doesn't complain. In many ways, he's the perfect employee. Do you like truffles? Sure. All right, so one of those and signing it to the robots. Co-founder of Zoom Pizza, Alex Garden, an expat Canadian living in Silicon Valley, calls this a cobot environment. It's a, a seamless marriage of robots and humans working together. Right now, Noel's making the crust using these machines. And then we have these sauce dispensers. These are Pepe and Jojo. And their job is to put the sauce exactly in the center of the pizza. And this is Marta. And Marta's job is to spread the sauce. Uh, it's not even two years yet. Um, but we've already won uh, over 10% of the market share in our trade area um, and without really trying. Cutting edge technology will soon enough make this totally automated from start to finish. In five years, you may even have a drone or a self-driving car delivering your pizza. This disruption of the labor force has been sneaking up on people for decades. With technology taking on jobs in manufacturing and agriculture, any type of manual labor has been a target, making some jobs obsolete. But artificial intelligence is taking it further. The target right now and in the future, white collar work. 
as computers are able to compete with the human brain in more complex ways than ever before. They can learn and analyze, and that means highly educated and high-paying jobs are the next big target. The concern, if people don't take this seriously, they will be left without work. Really, it's happening already, but it's in a subtle, uh, slightly unseen way. So it's not just... Sunil Johal is a Canadian expert in technology and public policy. He says Canada could see anywhere from 1.5 to 7.5 million jobs lost over the next decade due to automation. And while there's no consensus on just how many, the fact is jobs are already being lost. We're used to the manual labour jobs being taken by uh, machines, but now we're starting to see in uh, fields like medicine, law, investment banking, dramatic increases in the ability of computers to think as well or better than humans. And that's really the game changer uh, here because that's something that we've never seen before. Think about banking. ATMs started replacing bank tellers in the 90s. Not that long ago, Goldman Sachs employed 600 highly paid U.S. cash equity traders. Today, there are just two. They get the same amount of work done with the help of 200 computer engineers. I don't think outsiders would necessarily know that people are losing their jobs to software. But as a, an employee of the bank, you know, it was everywhere. So everyone was aware of it. Tori Shorman worked in the mortgage department at a major Canadian bank. She sat by and watched as her colleagues were shown the door. I witnessed about 40% of my department get laid off and the reason they were given was automation. Um, when the layoffs started, um, they, the first round was without warning and it was about 20% of our department. The department itself was about 130 people. And then we learned that, you know, further automation was going to occur and that this just wasn't the first time. So people started worrying a lot, thinking, oh, I'm next on the chopping block. And the race is on to create intelligent automation that can learn, make decisions, outthink the best and brightest. Ready or not, drastic change is coming. Really, nobody's immune from this, and we all need to prepare as if uh, this might be coming and affecting our jobs, no matter what we do. And if there's no fighting it, then maybe the smart decision is to get ahead of it. So what we're really doing is building the next generation of legal software. And these facts are actually taken from the Supreme Court of Canada. Benjamin O'Leary is co-founder of Blue Jay Legal. His software does much of the research of a lawyer. So in the past, what you've done is gone to a law library and walked through the stacks and found the books relevant to your case. And you'd you know, produce often a stack of materials to read. And then you'd go back to a desk and spend many hours working through all of those hard copy materials. So what we could do is pick this tangible expenditure classifier. And then we For example, have a question about an upcoming legal matter, tell it your problem, and it will analyze huge amounts of case law. It then creates a personalized solution. It's kind of grabbing these snippets from its database and producing a tailored explanation that's sensitive to the facts as we've entered them into the system. What this software does in moments would take a human days to do. How fast is the computer system learning? Uh, it's learning really quite quickly. So when we started training it uh, about two years ago, it was about 65% accurate and now it's over 90% accurate. So that's a pretty stark improvement in, in accuracy. But Benjamin hasn't completely given up on humans altogether. He is also training the next generation of legal minds. All right, good morning, let's get started. Um, it's interesting, uh, in this course, we're encountering a number of different new technologies. Do you ever talk about just the changing nature of what their job will be in technology? You know, the job of a lawyer in 10 years compared to what lawyers were doing 40 years ago, is that a conversation you sort of prepare them for? Absolutely. So one of the things that I do as a law professor is use some of the, the new tools that we're developing here at Blue Jay Legal to assist in the classroom. So I think the millennials see in this kind of technology an obvious ally in advising their clients. So it's a way for them to be better, stronger, 
lawyers and to really test their intuitions. And, and in years past, it was just technologically impossible to do that. It's only a good ally if you know how to uh, use the technology. Firms Best case that. scenario, know how to create it. I think in the future we're going to see most people aren't going to stop their education once they get out of high school, college or university. They're going to have to become lifelong learners. And that's what Tori Shorman is doing. At 32, she walked away from her job before it wasn't her call. I described the day that I gave in my two weeks notice as just shell shock. All my friends were so excited for me, saying like, oh, you're living the dream, you're doing what you want. But it was terrifying, to be honest, to, to give that up and to go without a paycheck for, eight, for two or three months. But um, now that I'm in it and doing that, like I'm way more confident that I've made the right choice. Shouldn't this be the key? Her choice was to take a chance on something called Lighthouse Labs in Toronto. They offer a three-month intensive course to essentially master coding. It meant radically changing her career, like many Canadians are doing now. Oh, I know, this is good, this is good. Let's do our PR page. <laughs> so far, it's been two weeks, and it's definitely been a, a huge challenge. Uh, a lot of ups and downs, but, I mean, we'll see where I am in eight weeks. <laughs> School founder Jeremy Shackey says a single class can have students in their teens and some in their 60s. There's a great conversation going on right now about coding as a more of a blue-collar job, if you will, and that it's really for everybody. Um, it's, this isn't about being a math wizard. Um, there are a lot of jobs there for people who just want to build, want to create, and a lot of jobs don't have that impact. No wonder then, hundreds showed up to this one-day event in downtown Toronto to inspire people to learn code some may even say adapt. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the HTML 500. So, Lara, what brought you here today? Um, an opportunity to learn about microprocessors. Children do it instinctively, but for people that haven't grown up with it, it's overwhelming and it's everywhere. Teaching people how to code. The concern is how complex some of these skills are and whether everyone can keep up. Why coding? Why is it something you think you need to be learning right now? I think it's like a fairly almost essential skill nowadays. Like everything has to do with IT and for getting jobs, like having coding background is really important. So is not learning an option, do you think? Well, if you want to be left behind, sure. And not wanting to be left behind is why Tori walked away from the world of finance and put her future on a new path. And while, you know, my career may not look like what my grandfather's career looked like in terms of like stable full-time employment and climbing the ladder, um, there's still gonna be lots of opportunities out there. For me, it's just, it's just new and different. There's nothing wrong with that. Not only is nothing wrong with that, it's what the future looks like for Canadian workers. A world of change is ahead. Many of today's jobs won't be the jobs of the future and all that increasingly intelligent technology will make sure of it. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. Well, if that story doesn't scare you, maybe this will. Some people find this new robot from Google-owned company kind of disturbing. It's called a hybrid because it combines legs with wheels. As you see, it's pretty flexible and can really get around. Maybe it'll put some competitive skateboarders out of work. When we come back, no robots, just a very human message. They will be your neighbors. They will be your co-workers. The life story of a former refugee is put to good use. And a gripping play about war inspired by someone who saw it up close. Time to look at the day's business numbers. The TSX rose 200 points. The dollar dropped three-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow hit a new record high, gaining 303 points. New record for the NASDAQ as well. The price of oil, though, fell 18 cents a barrel. Hello there, Facebook Live fans. Uh, we've got lots of questions that already came in just in the last few minutes uh, since we mentioned we were doing this. Just to let you know, this is just going to you, and in the studio at this time, they're setting up for what will be the next block, block three we call it, so you'll see things changing in the screen behind me. Don't worry about that. Uh, some of the questions. Pravin Arjun asks, 
Hi, Peter. If you get a chance to interview current U.S. president, what would you be most keen to know from him? A lot of, lot of things, uh, Pravin. I would be intrigued to know that uh, how he feels about the fact that there are many people using his country as a through way to get into our country, and it would seem that the border is pretty porous in a number of places. Does he worry that it's porous going the other way as well? Phoenix Chudzinski asks, Hello, Mr. Mansbridge. What would you say is the most important rule to follow as a broadcast journalist? Be fair, be accurate, uh, put things in context. That's three good ones. Uh, Michael Jimmy Prozinski asks, Hi, Peter, did you know Stuart McLean well? Could you share a story of you and him together? I did know Stuart well, knew him for, you know, for more than 30 years. We worked together at Ryerson University where he uh, was a, 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 a terrific teacher and professor uh, in journalism. He asked me to join him there for a couple of years, and I just watched the, just the way he was able to reach out to uh, to his audience in telling stories, the way he was able to reach out to students and, and helping them understand this business that we're in. Uh, Joe Pelly asked, Peter, what's the biggest fish you caught? <laughs> really? 32 pounds salmon off the West Coast. Seriously. Shocked me just as much, let me tell you. Jared Kushner asks, how do you stay positive as a journalist? What are your keys to happiness? Jared Kushner? Really? Jared Kushner, spelled a different way, mind you, is married to Ivanka Trump, is he not? But this Jared Kushner, on that question, how do you stay positive? There's positivity somewhere in every story we tell, and it, it's finding it and ensuring that you try to bring it into the, into the story as well. And there's so much good that we do uh, as journalists in, in, in telling stories that are important, sometimes stories that are gripping and sad, but it's positive because we're able to tell them and have an influence on people. Andrew Matheson asked, Peter, what responsibility does a journalist have to reveal their sources? And, and that's, this question goes on. You should know that in every case, our preferred option is to name our sources. But there are some cases, whistleblower cases, for example, as the question mentions, where that's not going to happen. Um, to protect the identity of, of that person. But in all cases where we're, we're protecting identities, we want to ensure we double, triple, quadruple source stories, but we want to make sure we're not being in any way used uh, as a grievance against someone or something else. One minute back, Mr. Mansbridge. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Um, Andrew Dolly asks, will you be a snowbird somewhere? <laughs> Maybe. Mary Brinkos asks, Peter, will you, uh, will you be traveling Canada and have your own television show? <laughs> I travel Canada. I have an, my own show already. Uh, Roderick Morris asks, Peter, in your opinion, what's the story you reported that triggered the largest emotional response in your fellow Canadians? There will have been lots of them. Domestically, uh, floods in Alberta, uh, the wildfires we saw in Alberta, saw them in Kelowna, overseas, the um, tsunami in the, the Southeast Asia, um, the earthquake in Haiti, all of those stories in the telling that was done on television and elsewhere prom promoted lots of reaction from people that showed the goodness in the hearts of Canadians. Okay, you got to get back to uh, real work. Good talking to you. Back in two seconds. A new exhibit has just opened at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg. It's called Our Canada, My Story, and it features several remarkable Canadians, including one from Halifax. Ali Duwali came here decades ago, feeling or fleeing war and violence in Somalia. He's been passionately giving back to his adopted homeland ever since. And as Carolyn Ray reports, he has a message for all of us. Sometimes you never know where life will take you. When the Museum for Human Rights asked Ali Duali to be part of their new exhibit, he was caught off guard. The Halifax man will be celebrating 20 years in Canada next week. I have seen somewhere else. I live another life. Duali is from Somalia. He fled to Kenya when civil war took over his home country. Gunfire became a regular sound in the afternoon. It was not a place uh, somebody who want to have a future in life could stay. Two decades later, he's been busy, 
first a firefighter, now in charge of diversity for the fire service. His career helped him provide for his growing family, which now includes eight children. He was also instrumental in raising millions to build this new mosque and community center, a second home. With my own family. In Winnipeg, the museum's curator was one of the people who chose Duali's story for the exhibit. She says she was struck by his words, that if he wasn't in Canada, he would likely be dead. I think that really resonated for what's at stake when it comes to welcoming refugees into our country and how important that is um, uh, for us to continue to do so. The current situation for refugees is something that weighs on Dwali's mind. He sees images of people from his home country desperately crossing into Canada on foot. He wants to give them hope and he wants Canadians to embrace them. I've been there. I know what's looked like. I lived that life. Our country has been built on all sorts of different waves of refugees. Jerry Mills says Duali's success and commitment to community represents an essential part of the country's fabric. That determination, that commitment um, is, is what defines uh, most immigrants. These are another fellow human being who've been uh, abused, uh, who've been displaced, uh, who's been tortured, uh, open your heart and your mind. They will be your neighbors, they will be your co-workers, uh, they will be your fellow citizens. I just had a good life. Ali Duali's story opened the exhibit in Winnipeg tonight. He hopes it helps people see that refugees are not threats. Carolyn Ray, CBC News, Halifax. Coming up next, a doctor serves his country on the battlefield. Then his son creates a powerful show about war. This is the story of building the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Between Jasper and Red Pass, a start is made. All the latest weapons employed by engineers in modern pipeline construction converge on the theaters of war. The enemy, one by one, toppling to echoing cries of timber. And the steel monsters arrive. To 140 sidings from Edmonton to Vancouver, 5,000 railway flat cars bring their loads of pipes and then to their individual prearranged spots in the continuous chain. They're linked together by a complicated process that assures 100% accuracy. The pipe is 24 inches in diameter, and every inch of it must be evenly coated. And then, check and recheck. Then a wrapping is added, made from glass, felt, and asbestos, as the men observe their finished product laid to rest. A continuous tube, liquid railway, stretching 718 miles. The big question is, of course, whether there is life on Mars, and the short answer is that it's not impossible. No one knows what Mars really looks like, but this week, streaming back from deep space is the best information in history, bringing us nearer the answers concerning the origin of life, whether man is something special or a special freak. The search for life on Mars is still continuing. Data received from the Viking landers have puzzled NASA scientists, and within the past two days, they've been able to confirm that the ice caps of Mars are really frozen water, not carbon dioxide as once believed. So the chances of finding life get better with each passing day. Its past was hostile and torn by meteors. Its present is cold and barren. A colony here would seem a futile fantasy. But today's dreamers are scientists, and they do their dreaming for NASA. I think the possibility of Mars as a second home for mankind is very important for our future as a race. The students are building a prototype Martian colony called Marsville. It's on Earth, but they do understand what it will take to settle on Mars. The temperature on Mars is a lot colder than on Earth. And these students understand cooperation is the only way to get to Mars. I mean, with all the technology they have now, we could have somebody go up pretty soon. They've come from all over the world for this meeting of the International Mars Society, 
They've got bumper stickers. They've got a Martian flag already picked out. The one question that always comes up is this. Is it worth the many billions more to put people on the surface of the red planet rather than just machines? The Mars fans here admit the barriers are huge, but they also say we have the capability and the money to get to Mars. All we need now is the will to do it. To find out more, we need to go out into space, and space research, like politics, is the art of the possible. What we would like to do must be weighed against what we can do. Canada's 12 years in Afghanistan may be overshadowed for some by a new wave of global crises. But for many, there is no forgetting that war. More than 40,000 Canadian soldiers fought there. 158 died there. It marked one Vancouver playwright. During its recent run, his play, The Fighting Season, impressed critics and haunted audiences. A testament to the impact of a war he never saw with his own eyes. Laura Lynch has the story. Oh, thank you. It's a sellout crowd for a play that's winning attention. Yeah. No, you are. I think you are. And awards. Because you're in that light. The I'm actors are squeezing in a last rehearsal. So you guys got your tickets. And the playwright, Sean Harris Oliver, is setting the stage. This play, it doesn't glamorize war and it doesn't, it's not really about war. It's more about just humans and what happens to a person when they experience some sort of trauma. Okay, now we're it's called The Fighting Season. Set in Afghanistan and here at home, it tracks a medic, a nurse, and a civilian doctor. Hey, we're not going to lose you. We're not losing him. Their lives become bound together by one terrible incident involving an injured Afghan civilian and a bomb. Oliver makes no apologies for the gritty, dark nature of the scenes. I wanted people to feel strongly about what they were seeing on stage. The inspiration for the play comes from a doctor who works here in Kelowna and who the playwright knows very, very well. We've already operated on this one. It's Sean's father, Dr. Jack Oliver. He's fixed his share of broken bones for everyone from pro football players to Olympic athletes to the elderly and frail. All right. He volunteered to go to Kandahar in 2008. The injuries were, some of them were horrific. They, because of the nature of the shock to the, to the body from the explosive action of IEDs and things like that. Like there's got to be a way to communicate this. He never expected his son to transform his experience into a play, much less one that's deeply moving audiences. Uh, disconnected from morality, like that whole moral, like what the hell, how do I make sense out of this? During a discussion with audience members, Sean senses the impact. He also saw the impact Afghanistan had on his father. My dad said, I'm going, I have skills, I'm going to serve my country, I can help, I can make a contribution. And of course, when he came back, he had changed his tune about that. It, he was, there was a loss there. He came back a bit um, hardened by the experience. My memories I still have, of course. They're very vivid there, uh, but I, I haven't, fortunately, I think, dwelled on them. It's Saturday night, showtime yet again, and Sean is welcoming special guests. On this night, Jack, Sean's mother Lori, and Sean sit together. They shipped me home the next day. Jack Oliver may downplay the impact of all he saw and experienced in Afghanistan. But there's no doubt this play has touched him as it shines a light on the pain endured by those charged with saving lives shattered by war. Laura Lynch, CBC News, Vancouver. Up next, tiny creatures make big news. And in one case, some pretty big bucks. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, a CBC report of Inuit children taken from their homes to live with non-Inuit foster families is raising alarms as too similar to the residential schools tragedy. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. This afternoon in St. John's, Newfoundland, a young man named Terry Fox started running. Many people have run or walked across Canada, but Fox hopes to be the first to do it with an artificial leg. I got 
a lot of positive attitude and I think I can do it. He calls his running style the Foxtrot. After 25 days in Newfoundland, Terry had raised $25,000. That song was commissioned by the Cancer Society, which had its own doubts when he started off. Now, as he pounds out the kilometers, the money pours in, most of it in cash. He's got all the guts in the world, and I wish him all the luck in the world, too, and I hope he makes it. What do you think of Terry Fox? I think he's great. He'll make it. He'll make it. The run to City Hall, down University Avenue, took Terry by hundreds of people. It was an emotional moment for many of them. I knew I was going to make 20 miles, but when people were out there like that, oh, it was incredible today. We've seen him surrounded by crowds of supporters, but the crowds go home. Terry keeps running. I'm stubborn and competitive, and I, I don't know, I, I really enjoy life. I enjoy challenges. I don't like people feeling sorry for me. I don't like pity, and I wanted to show these other people what I could do. The National with Norton Nash. Good evening. A story of incredible courage came to an end today. At a news conference... Yesterday I was running, and I had noticed a little bit of hardness in breathing. And I, had to, I decided I had to go see the doctor. And it was discovered then that the cancer had spread. And now I've got cancer in my lungs. And, uh... From one end of the country to the other, there has been a spontaneous outpouring of support for Terry Fox and cancer research. Rarely, if ever, have so many people been so deeply moved by one individual. If it comes to the point where I'm told I'm gonna die of cancer, I haven't got a chance, I've gotta be able to face that and... Good evening. And Terry Fox died this morning in a British Columbia hospital, one month before his 23rd birthday. Well, he was a very brave boy, I must say, and I feel sad, very sad about it. Don't cry, love. It's all right. Don't cry, sweetie. It's all right. I think he touched the hearts of a lot of Canadians, and they all really look up to him. More than our sympathy, we would like you to express as well our profound gratitude for the gift which Terry gave to all of us, the gift of his own boundless courage and hope. Canadians everywhere walked and jogged and ran to raise money for the fight against cancer. He accomplished more in a few short months than most of us can hope for in a lifetime. Well, before we go tonight, two stories about some big discoveries that started very small. This is exciting. <laughs> the oldest fossils on the planet. It relates us to our origin. These old rocks in Quebec could hold the earliest evidence of life on Earth. Scientists discovered the fossils, believed to be four billion years old, along the eastern shore of Hudson Bay. The ancient tube-shaped structures closely resemble modern-day microbes that live under the sea. The find is especially intriguing because the fossils date back to a time when scientists believe Mars may have been able to support life. And it's not quite as old, but another microbe also made history today. A blob of mold from Dr. Alexander Fleming's lab has sold at auction $14,000 for that spore. The 90-year-old sample is signed with a note saying it was used to make penicillin. That's The National this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.